Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webcast today. On behalf of Ethisphere, my name is Chelsea Camella, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Corporate Risk and Responsibility in a Disruptive Environment of Terrorism, Violence, and Insider Threats. There are a few logistical items I'd like to address before we begin. We encourage you to engage in the question and answer portion of today's webcast by using the chat function located in your viewing experience. Our presenters today will reserve time at the end of the webcast to address as many questions as they can. If we do run out of time, we will follow up via an email thereafter. Following the live webcast, we will also be providing you via email a link to view the recording as well as the presentation materials. Uh, we're very pleased to be partnering with Control Risk on today's webcast, and I'd like to quickly introduce you, our presenters, so we can jump right into the discussion. Joining us today is Bill O'Dell, Senior Managing Director, Crisis and Security Consulting with Control Risk, James Koenig, Leader, PH Privacy and Cyber Implementation Solutions at Paul Hastings, and we're pleased to also have Clinton Preston, Director of Analytics and Insights for Global Security Operations at Walmart. With all that said, I'd like to now turn the floor over to Bill so we can begin today's presentation. Bill? Chelsea, thanks very much, and uh, thank you everyone from, for joining. Um, as Chelsea said, uh, my name is Bill Udell. I'm Senior Managing Director for our crisis management and security consulting business, so uh, basically sort of overall business resiliency and security services. Um, and I come from a uh, background in CIA. I spent eight years there as an operations officer and an analyst um, working mostly in the Middle East um, on terrorism issues. Um, I'm joined by uh, Jim uh, Koenig, who will uh, introduce himself a bit later on, and then Clinton as well, um, and very happy to have them uh, on board on this uh, webinar. So my role here is basically I'm going to take about uh, 15 or 20 minutes and talk about uh, the threat and sort of um, provide a sort of context around um, the issues that we're talking about um, in terms of the evolving terrorism threat, specifically how international developments have uh, impacted uh, the domestic threat, and then with a particular focus shifting um, from there onto the workplace and sort of homegrown extremism and where um, traditional workplace issues intersect with, uh, with self-radicalization particularly in the U.S. and Western Europe. And this is sort of in the context of, um, you know, increasing concern about this and then sort of the FBI increasingly approaching companies and informing them um, of, uh, of radicalized or potentially radicalized people within their, within their workforce. And we've done a lot of work um, helping clients sort of identify those, identify the threats around them, and then, uh, and then mitigate those risks um, once they pop up. And then we'll talk a little bit about what this means for duty of care for an organization, um, how, that, um, how this evolving terrorism picture has, um, has sort of made that, uh, made that duty of care calculation a bit more complicated and the kinds of things that companies need to do, not just to stay ahead of the threat, but also to sort of keep even with their peers and their competitors. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Jim, who will talk a little bit about how uh, terrorism and risk, pre risk prevention merges with cybersecurity and privacy, uh, and also very importantly talk about the legal implications of uh, monitoring employees within the workforce. And then we'll turn it over to Clinton to talk through a uh, sort of a corporate case study and um, what, they've, what they've done well and the challenges they've seen, and then we'll open it up um, for uh, the sort of dialogue within the, uh, within the question and answer, um, uh, the typed question and answer uh, sort of uh, format that we have, as Chelsea mentioned. Just a note quickly on this. Um, there are obviously a number of um, right-wing and left-wing uh, groups, um, ideologically motivated groups that sort of manifest themselves as, uh, as terrorists, as well as single-issue extremist groups that are all threats to uh, corporations as well um, and sort of impacting the terrorism threat in the workplace. We're going to focus here, in my comments at least, um, largely on the Islamist uh, threat and Islamist terrorism and, and that, that homegrown threat because that's where we've seen sort of the real shift um, and the evolution in the last 24 months or so. Um, so kind of focusing on uh, what's different, if you will. So as we look at that homegrown and workplace threat and the sort of um, the, the, how international developments have, uh, particularly around Islamic State in the last 24 months, on the international stage have then impacted the domestic and the homegrown threats that we see in the U.S. 
and the West in general, there are a number of trends that we should mention that we'll, uh, we'll talk about a little bit more. And this is particularly in the last 24 months, but particularly post-Paris, post-San Bernardino. Um, so the, the, the major trends that we're seeing that are sort of impacting us here are a trend towards um, inspiration, so radical inspiration rather than direction, particularly true um, in cases we've seen in the U.S. Um, as I mentioned as well, radicalization and ideology, so a, a um, Islamic State branded ideology as a complement to workplace grievance, personal rage, or, or other mental health issues, it's creating a new challenge for organizations and companies. Um, smaller and unpredictable conspiracies as a result of this sort of homegrown trend that are proving a challenge for not just companies but also governments and traditional intelligence apparatuses. Um, then an emphasis on soft targets, often without symbolic value, so aimed at inspiring fear rather than making the sort of old Al-Qaeda grand statement, um, also providing a challenging challenge in terms of um, you know, changing the, the number of targets that are sort of seen as reasonably foreseeable. And then scripted but relatively unsophisticated attack methods. And we'll talk a little bit more about attack methods later on and how that makes the situation more challenging as well. So just a very brief um, snapshot. I'm not going to go through this in detail, um, but this is a sort of brief uh, uh, visual history of the evolution of Islam, uh, Islamist terrorism um, since its uh, sort of modern inception in the 50s and 60s. And what you see is an increasing transnational focus, so away from trying to influence change in the domestic sphere, uh, sphere and a focus on the far abroad uh, as you get into the early 2000s or late 90s and early 2000s with Al-Qaeda, and then as you push farther into the, uh, the birth of the Islamic State in sort of 2000, um, 2010 to, to 2015, and a push from sort of um, more tangible uh, local um, aims to um, transnational, um, more transcendental uh, aims, if you will and a push from um, the directed into the, uh, into the inspired. So why is that happening? Why, why are we seeing more of that, um, that transnational and, and inspired focus? The first is, as it relates to the Islamic State, um, is, a, uh, is a sort of reaction to battlefield losses. Um, so even you know, very recently we've seen the Iraqi army push into um, or push towards Fallujah um, we've seen Islamic State's um, uh, actual ground that they cover um, in Iraq and Syria shrink. We've seen victories for, uh, obviously, um, Bashar al-Assad's government in Syria against Islamic State, as well as the Iraqi government's um, efforts in northern Iraq. Um, and essentially this was, um, I would say, nearly inevitable because as soon as they became a caliphate and wanted to hold land, unlike, um, unlike al-Qaeda, um, they could be engaged by traditional means. And seeing that, um, um, now focusing on things that are much harder for um, intelligence agencies and, and militaries to engage, which is this transnational um, focus and fo refocusing on what's m more successful and, and likely to provide them more long-term influence. Another, another reason why um, there's sort of this increasing focus on the homegrown and the transnational um, is the potential that they have um, to engage foreign fighters. Um, so as you see, uh, if you look at sort of across Western Europe and, and the West in general, um, and including the United States, um, the number of foreign fighters that have been produced um, by the Islamic State and what they've been doing in Syria and, uh, and Iraq is enormous. Um, it, it far uh, outpaces what we saw in the 80s with the... Um, the Soviet uh, war in Afghanistan, so the returnees um, from Syria and Iraq are um, are quite large, and it's a it's a real challenge for intelligence agencies, especially in um, in Western Europe, to deal with. So, particularly if you look at that graph on the right hand side of the screen, um, the 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 absolute numbers are quite large, but if you look at um, how these stack up, particularly in smaller smaller uh, European countries with smaller intelligence agencies and smaller security forces and less 
um, bandwidth to be able to focus on these, the um, sort of the, the the percentage per population um, numbers are quite telling. So you see quite large percentages in Belgium, quite large percentages in Austria um, and Denmark, um, places that are struggling to get a grip of this. Now in the United States, um, for a number of reasons that we won't get into here, the foreign fighter blowback is not as significant, but for those with operations in Europe, this is something um, quite important to consider when, when thinking about the homegrown threat. Now these um, this is obviously providing fodder for um, Islamic State to actually direct attacks. It's also um, providing a, a, a knowledge transfer element to those that are, um, could be potentially inspired by Islamic State. So the area where um, Islamic State is really a differentiator from previous incarnations of um, Islamist um, extremism as well as um, sort of non-Islamist um, uh, extremists is really around um, this sort of global incitement and the rising sophistication and slickness of their marketing. Their ability and willingness to put um, uh, their inspiration, their attack methodologies, um, their, their sort of targeting wishes and um, the, the ideology and the information in general into the vernacular, so into the, uh, the language that can be understood by their potential adherents all around the world is uh, quite unprecedented. Um, and we're, um, we're sort of in a new world in this space, whereas the old Al-Qaeda, uh, you know, people would, um, you know, followers would wait around for months for the next sort of recording from Osama bin Laden that would come out um, through um, Al Jazeera or some other means, um, and uh, and and that would sort of be it for you know six six months to a year. This is a daily um, sort of onslaught of very slick marketing that um, everyone has access to, so quite a bit different. And interestingly, this is also sort of in the context of a broad decline in the, uh, the ambient sort of general terrorist environment, so stepping away from purely um, Islamically focused uh, extremism um, now into the sort of wider terrorism threat. Um, so you see in, um, in a lot of places in terms of the uh, security force response and as well as the... the um, the, the, the focus of the groups is, is sort of having an impact. So overall terrorism activity you know, declined in most of the world from 2014 to 2015. But because of this sort of Islamic State strategy, if you look at the West and the far right, which includes the United States, um, this shift in Islamic State strategy has actually increased um, uh, what we would consider terrorism activity. So that's plots, cells, actual attacks um, in, uh, in the West. And this is sort of, as we see um, a, um, a, in talking about this evolution, um, this is going from what we had you know, sort of looked at as um, uh, Al-Qaeda inspired um, post 9-11 um, to Al-Qaeda incited in the sort of mid 2000s as security forces were really gripping um, Al-Qaeda um, all across the world. And then now getting into, you're seeing the in 2014, 2015, 2016, you're seeing both the impact of the Islamic State's broader incitement, um, particularly uh, as it relates to homegrown issues, as well as the security force and, um, uh, and intelligence and law enforcement response to that. So in red are um, disrupted plots, um, which obviously have picked up not only because there are more plots, but also because there are more people looking for plots. So overall activity with Islamic State incitement has, has increased significantly um, throughout Western Europe and the United States. And you look at where this is occurring, so what does it mean for, for the U.S. And, and U.S. workforces? The dark circles, and, and circles are um, sort of uh, directly proportional to the number of, um, of clusters, we're calling them, of, um, of either self-radicalized or uh, foreign groups, so homegrown or foreign groups. The dark, um, the dark circles are um, groups that have been identified by law enforcement as um, 
of foreign directed groups that have been interdicted. And as you would imagine, those are in you know, large population centers in large urban areas with um, you know, a, a, a heavy uh, Muslim population as well in which they're um, drawing from and, and being able to sort of hide in. Um, but if you look at the lighter circles, these are homegrown clusters that are not foreign directed, um, are self-radicalized or small groups of conspiracies that are self-radicalized. And those are in many, many more cities, um, much harder for you know, very much smaller, um, uh, much smaller conspiracies, much harder for traditional intelligence mechanisms, whether they be um, sort of threat assessments of companies or whether they be law enforcement and intelligence apparatuses to um, to root out and find the smaller the continue the smaller the conspiracy, the harder it is to find out. So this is the primary challenge. And you look at how that manifests itself. So as we talked about um, the sort of nexus of, uh, uh, of workplace violence and or traditional workplace violence issues and, um, and self-radicalized extremism, just a few manifestations of this threat um, the, in the United States in particular too that we've um, sort of called out the workplace attack in Oklahoma back in uh, September of 2014, which was obviously an unbalanced individual that attacked and killed um, a co-worker in Oklahoma over a workplace grievance, but he was later found out to be um, sort of uh, a ISIS follower and, and had been following ISIS online um, and had been uh, radicalized. And then the more recent uh, December 2015 um, uh, plot in Rochester, uh, again, um, by a sort of unstable Islamic State uh, sympathizer. And very similar to incidents in Europe that have involved um, sort of this, this convergence of um, workplace violence and, and radicalization um, in, in those areas. So in the interest of time, we won't go through these in, uh, in a lot of detail, but we have um, sort of four categories that obviously intermix between internet extremists who are very active on social media and, and often recent uh, local converts, uh, inspired violent actors with really no history of violent extremism, but possibly a, a mental disorder and, and motivated by personal grievance. Lone wolf jihadists, similar to those um, that uh, conducted the San Bernardino attack, and then repatriated foreign fighters, obviously sort of the most, probably the most dangerous group, but less likely in the United States. I think a really important point here is the, the presence of social media and the internet um, with all of these. Um, so what we've really seen um, in, the last, um, in the last decade or so is this really rapidly accelerating, uh, the internet really rapidly accelerating uh, radicalization so in, for the homegrown threat. So from 2002 to 2015, we've seen the time to radicalization. So from the time that you can sort of identify that it started to the time that someone could be identified as radicalized, um, cut down from 16 months to 10 months. And we've seen cases of radicalization that involve the internet go from 37% back in 2002 to now 80%. Um, so this really shows, obviously, how ubiquitous the internet and, um, and, and social media is in this area, but how effective the Islamic State has been at, at grasping this uh, in a way that um, Al-Qaeda and others before were not, or are still not, um, sort of a manifestation of the competition between Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. So if we, as, as we look at um, sort of attack methods, um, this is a, a, a really important consideration for um, looking at mitigation measures. Um, homegrown extremists, and it's, it's very true of those in the U.S. from the, both the plots and the actual attacks that have been um, carried out and then also those that have been stopped, um, are often uh, overly ambitious. Um, so we see what we see actually being carried out is a sort of lower sophistication of attack. So incendiary devices, um, vehicles being used as weapons, knife attacks, firearms, these things are what homegrown extremists um, are successful at. It's not, as you see, um, traditional IET, IED attacks. It's not VBIEDs. It's not rockets and missiles and generally not suicide bombing. Um, and what the Islamic State has really done especially recently, is grasp that well. Um, so they have focused a lot of their, um, and not just Islamic State, but also Al-Qaeda, 
they focused a lot of their um, online efforts to radicalize around relatively unsophisticated attacks. Um, so um, focus on firearms, um, focus on you know, potential assassination operations. Interestingly, those pushing now into the business realm instead of just focused on, um, on, uh, on anti-government activity. Um, so you know, looking at potentially targeting private citizens. Um, and then as well focusing on um, you know, looking at using vehicles themselves as weapons um, looking at using hatchets and things like that. So basically, whatever you can get your hands on, improve the chances that you'll be able to, to um, execute a successful attack, um, and don't try to worry about getting too sophisticated. So all of these things, the, the, um, the unsophistication of the attack methods, the ability of potential threat actors to get their hands on what would be a very effective attack method, as well as the smaller and smaller um, conspiracies in a wider area of uh, a wider geographical area in the U.S. and in Western Europe, and the sort of um, uh, and the push by Islamic State to act locally, has really sort of combined to create a number of problems for organizations that we're sort of trying to get a grip of, um, and it sort of centers around this corporate role of duty of care. It's become increasingly complex. So the, the litmus test for duty of care being what is reasonably foreseeable. What are the threats that are out there to the workforce um, that are reasonably foreseeable and do you have programs around, around them to mitigate them? Um, so that in this, in this environment of, um, of a wider uh, targeting table and a, a wider sort of set of potential methodologies, that what is reasonably foreseeable is a lot harder to grasp. Also, we have intelligence as a really significant big data problem. So there's an enormous amount of threat information coming into corporations and how to operationalize that and turn it from what is raw data into actual operational data uh, is quite complex. And we've done a lot of work building intelligence teams um, for clients to help them um, both with the feeds that come in, sort of um, providing those feeds, but then also um, how to operationalize those feeds and put them in business context. One positive thing we've seen, particularly for security departments, is the ability to sort of capitalize on what is front of mind. Obviously, terrorism is still a, 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 low, um, a low probability event for an individual organization, but a high impact event. And that being on the front of mind of executives, security departments are able to sort of go back to a back to basics approach and do things that they have known for a long time or best practice, but haven't had the, um, haven't had the internal buy-in to, uh, to actually execute we're now seeing that. And the kind of things that they're doing and the kind of things we're helping them with are sort of tweaking traditional governance and, sh and assurance programs to meet the evolved threat. So um, looking, at, um, looking at their threat assessments, looking at their threat monitoring capability, which Jim will talk about uh, a little bit more, but then also looking at crisis management programs, business continuity programs, workplace violence, and travel security. So reassessing those in light of a new threat, how the new threat impacts them, and then putting together governance programs that tie all those things together um, to, to protect their, um, their, their assets um, and their people and their financial health. And then flowing from those programs are the corresponding operation, operational risk management programs from increasing focus on physical security as it relates to the sort of attack methodologies that we've talked about. So obviously, there's concern about uh, IEDs and VBIDs in, um, in certain um, jurisdictions, but obviously increasing focus on active shooter programs and, uh, and mitigation against more unsophisticated or lower sophistication uh, of attacks. And then the sort of, for in, within the workplace context, um, lots of, uh, of concern around technical monitoring and how do you um, how do you get ahead of the potential threat from within the workplace um, before the FBI comes and tells you actually you have a, a radicalized person um, that you have to deal with? How, to, how do you sort of work within a uh, traditional workplace violence program, but then also provide some technical tools um, around behavioral and trend analysis that will be able to give you indicators um, that you might have a, uh, a person of concern or a vulnerability um, uh, within your midst? 
Um, and then with that, I will turn it over to Jim to uh, talk about a couple of those last points in a little bit more detail. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks very much, Bill. Well, for this segment, we're going to be talking about terrorism and information crimes. And increasingly, uh, terrorism is both fueled by uh, and conducted uh, using information uh, techniques. And we're going to talk a little more practically uh, from a corporate perspective about simple ways to leverage existing safeguards that you have um, so that you can prevent, detect, and respond um, to, to terrorism um, threats. Uh, I, I guess I should do my introduction. Um, and uh, um, I lead the uh, Paul Hastings new PH Privacy and Cyber Implementation Solutions Group. We're a group comprised of attorneys and former chief privacy and security officers um, from Fortune 100 companies providing integrated legal uh, business and technical uh, advice and implementation solutions. Uh, from my background, um, I've been an expert to the Federal Trade Commission, um, the Office of Civil Rights, part of Health and Human Services, and the CFPB in Financial Services. Um, I co-founded the International Association of Privacy Professionals, um, and I formally led globally the privacy and co-led security at PricewaterhouseCoopers and Booz Allen uh, for over uh, 12 years. And so in that time, I've had a chance to see a lot of companies, and in, in during this presentation, I'm going to try and share best practices. I think uh, last count, someone from my marketing group looked and said that um, um, over the last 10 years, I've represented um, over a third of the current Fortune 100 uh, companies in cyber and terrorist and uh, uh, privacy-related matters. So some of those practices that you'll hear today are things that have already been implemented um, and uh, companies are, are, are using. So let's get to the discussion uh, that, we, that we wanted to today. And increasingly, the conversation around terrorism is also involving discussion around information crimes. Now, traditionally, um, uh, when, when the uh, companies and workplace are involved, the information crime indirectly supports the terrorist activity. Here, the terrorist organization gains unauthorized access um, to informational assets uh, to be able to put together an attack. And whether it's going to be about people and their schedules and locations and travel plans, or about building schematics and operations, um, or operations at the company in terms of uh, security. Uh, and what their schedule is, what background of people to try and infiltrate um, uh, the personnel at the company to be able to um, uh, either recruit them uh, um, or, or they'll place themselves at the company or they'll, and, and become knowledgeable insiders um, to be able to, to uh, further an attack. And then finally in this area too, depending on the type of company, if we have one that's more in, involved um, uh, in some type of chemical um, or uh, technology companies where chemical weapons or some type of incendiary uh, material uh, could be acquired, um, uh, those are also at risk as well. Now, okay, so information about terrorism that they can use to either get materials or to conduct the, act the, the, the actual activity at the, um, directed toward the company, but also some of the terrorist activity isn't just some of the physical, it's actually using cyber attacks and disruptions to directly create problems. So the information crimes here are direct in that they're targeting military and government databases to try and get access to information or um, send denial of service attacks or malware or other things to either gain access to information or to bring down those networks and cease operations and to be able to cause problems so that they don't operate um, either um, uh, as standalone or in conjunction with a physical attack as well to make response impaired um, or prevented. Uh, also, attacks on critical infrastructure is one of the, the ways um, that cybersecurity is coming in. Um, 
I mean, one of the examples of that is, is Power Grid uh, and uh, bringing down um, uh, some of the companies in, in, uh, um, that support overall distribution of, of power. But uh, there are a number of different critical infrastructure areas that have been targets and part of the um, uh, presidential um, directives and activities have helped support bring together um, um, uh, communities for companies to be able to participate um, and help share indicators of threat information um, and uh, to be able to um, uh, help prepare themselves. I've worked with and helped organize a couple of the ISACs in for several different industries, so if you haven't learned about them or heard about them, that's an area to, to, to jump in and to learn uh, both from others in the industry um, as well as um, uh, um, and to learn about potential threats as well. But in short, the implication here is that information crimes are increasingly common to both support indirectly terrorist activities and attacks and threats using company uh, information that uh, gained um, uh, through unauthorized and unlawful means or secondarily directly by cyber attacks or disruption they're creating problems within um, systems and architectures to be able to cause havoc in one way or another. If you take a look overall at the spectrum of cyber attacks, terrorism is part of it. And when you look at the scale of, and this is an overgeneralization, but the sophistication and the frequency, it's increasing. The sophistication um, uh, is higher, maybe not as high as uh, the uh, state intelligence services um, or the state actors um, or organized crime in terms of uh, um, um, their efforts. But in the new environment, the threats are increasingly uh, common. Um, so whether uh, you know, it's the Chinese attacks that uh, have increasingly caused um, widespread um, problems, but often they're seeking intellectual property um, to be able to, or financial information from financial institutions to jumpstart those industries within their own company. Organized crimes going after slightly different information where they're focused uh, on financial account information um, and or credit card information for credit card fraud, which is the largest form of organized crime cyber exploitation. Um, and, and terrorists, here the information is somewhat similar. While part of it looks like the nation state actors where they're going after intellectual property in some of the contexts and examples I gave on the prior page, uh, but they're also go going after information that you're looking that's similar to what you would uh, have knowledgeable insiders you're watching to make sure they're just not corporate in impropriety, making sure that people aren't looking at other employee schedules and personal information, things like that. So increasingly, some of the threats, you know, the first part, what is the information that could be sought? And some of those va the valuable information that you have are things that you're already watching for other purposes. And so, um, as Bill had mentioned before, one of the ways that they're helping, and we're helping um, as well, is to help organizations expand their scope of some of the safeguards and to be able to um, uh, increasingly build their capability or take the capability they have and to just increase the focus on terrorism as well in addition um, to corporate espionage um, uh, and uh, workplace safety uh, and propriety. Uh, but cyber is an increasing threat but the terrorism segment within it uh, is an important part to keep track of. Now, from a company, you know, if, if Bill described before, and I talked a little bit about cyber, so you know what the threats are to some extent, and you take a look at the information assets that you have, the second step would be, okay, once you know the threats, what's the information or what do we want to protect within the organization, then the next is, okay, how do we focus that and watch the threat actors and, and, and the information that they want to be able to detect, prevent, um, or recover that information? And so here, the external actors, 
the terrorist groups that are outside the organization um, are, are one set of threat actors that, uh, that you're looking for, um, or the terrorist-motivated cyber hackers, some of the things that Bill had talked about um, in more depth in, in, uh, um, in, in his section. And typically, they're outsiders. So they're trying to go through typical network penetration and getting into companies. They're using cyber malware to get information. It's the same that any, anybody from the outside would do using IT. That being said, the, in, the sharpest increase within cyber and informational crimes is among the internal actors. While cyber consequences are growing significantly, the, one of the fastest, uh, the fastest segments that's growing is from knowledgeable insiders overall, which would include the terrorist subset within that. Now here, knowledgeable insiders uh, um, get, have access to security networks, buildings, facilities, files, record, um, uh, records, um, uh, a chemical, plant, and other things that uh, um, could be part of a terrorist threat and plot. Now, when you're looking at which employees and how to monitor and how to focus your attention, often the scheme of the terrorist group um, or the informational crime um, uh, um, uh, um, perpetrator is to be a part-time worker. Here, their job is actually to be placed at several companies with part-time jobs so they could be at multiple companies and receive credentials to the networks in the system, credentials to the buildings and facilities and the other assets that we talked about. And part-time and temporary workers um, are actually three times more likely than full-time employees to conduct these type of informational crimes and uh, um, potentially are a good way to help focus your efforts. Now, when it's organized, um, the jobs that are often sought after for these temporary uh, positions, which would often lead to these crimes, janitorial, um, IT programmers, uh, there's a lot of contract programmers there um, where you, where even though there are background checks, they're, they're commonly uh, fraudulently modified or, or information given um, or spoofed or somebody else's name. Uh, uh, accounting is another area which you wouldn't think but to be able to get financial records and to carry on different types of terrorist uh, uh, plots and activities um, or financial um, theft to help support their activity. And um, physical security, interestingly enough. Security gates, the very people that you, that you bring in to help protect and guard the gate um, are the ones that uh, in some occasions um, at a higher degree are the part-time workers, um, often from, from agencies, that, uh, um, uh, that have some of the characters that you'd want to watch out for. And so as you're monitoring the different players within your company on the knowledgeable insiders, we're going to talk a little bit more about it, but a really important point is to be aware of the legal and regulatory requirements for monitoring employees. There are various requirements um, uh, regarding notice um, that vary um, by states in the U.S., in some cases, you need to have written, signed consent, depending on the type of monitoring that you're, you're doing. Uh, and uh, outside of the United States, there's even more sensitivity, particularly in Europe, about the requirement of providing notice for employee monitoring, let alone for things that are outside of work-related issues. And so the sensitivity and the requirements are there. Um, you know, that could be the subject of an entire another call, but phone, um, uh, and email are the primary ones that have requirements. And so depending on your company and the jurisdiction that you operate, uh, it's important that you take a look at those things. Once you've identified the threats um, and the people, and you start planning your activities um, to, to uh, help monitor your program, uh, the, the people from the threats, uh, it's important to make sure that you take a look at those legal avenues to make sure they're covered. Okay. so. Once you know threats, the actors, and now, and you want to know what what should be and you have what should be protected at the company, let's take a look at some of the safeguards that can be leveraged 
to help you. And I talk about on the next uh, um, two slides, administrative and technical controls um, that are at your ability. Now, first, a little bit that Bill talked about, um, and then we're also going to have a case study uh, following my discussion, uh, is incident and crisis uh, response plans. And typically, and historically, often they're just IT plans, and they're looking for malware and, and simple things. But increasingly, um, uh, incident response plans have been adding cyber um, nuances to it, or then being involved to be uh, crisis plans. And then those grow into risk plans. And so there's really a trend in integrating, or at least coordinating, but increasingly integrating many of these plans and the activities that come from it. Now, there's different expertise required for the different disciplines, but some of the, the processes and some of the responses and some of the, the players are the same, and so that's where governance charters are evolving. So we've put together a number of governance charters that help coordinate these varied activities that require the similar type of crisis response um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to terrorist activity as well as to cyber and to other um, uh, companies and corporate uh, um, eventualities. And uh, so besides the, the trend generally to take these integrated crisis incident response programs, increasingly there's a trend in some companies um, to coordinate and even integrate physical and techni technical security overall. And that helps uh, companies uh, watch and correlate uh, across horizon, both the uh, from physical assets and door, um, uh, when people enter doors and buildings uh, uh, with the same time they're looking at files and things like that, looking for abnormalities. And the more data you have, um, the better you're able to see trends and signals of potentially bad actors and threat activity. Um, additionally, uh, the, uh, the cyber centers um, um, that um, are watching for cyber, they're also starting to look for terrorist and physical activity. Often they were separately done by physical security, but we're bringing those things uh, together. And as we'll also hear in a little bit about Walmart, they've taken an approach where they're, they're starting to coordinate and integrate um, risk from multiple places um, uh, centrally. It's a, it's a fascinating story and something um, to, to learn from. And an additional type of plan and procedure some companies uh, are putting together, and I've seen some, they're not that common, but if they believe that they're a target, they'll have bomb and attacker procedures, what to do if there's a shooter on premises, or what to do if uh, there has been um, uh, an attack that, that's happened, so that there is a game plan um, uh, in, in, those, in those cases. Other types of policies um, and notices and consents are another type of administrative uh, um, control that uh, companies are working on as well. As I mentioned before about the monitoring controls and notices uh, and policies, that's an important thing to enable that uh, important safeguard. Additionally, approaching works councils in Europe to make sure that uh, they are uh, um, informed and aligned with the types of activities and monitoring and things that you do. Um, uh, sure, they want safety, but at the same time, they also respect privacy. And so while you don't have to in detail uh, tell them the efforts, but uh, uh, at least recently given the attacks in Europe, um, that has been uh, um, uh, a positive uh, conversation in most cases. Another area for policy um, development has been perimeter and uh, uh, reception desk procedures uh, and making sure that they're more audited and people are followed, they're adding more video cameras that are there, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. And then the last one under policies and procedures uh, is that at the end of last year, um, there, uh, um, uh, uh, there was a law in Congress passed that allowed threat information to be shared with the Department of Homeland Security from companies of indicators of threat activity. And I've got a whole slide on that, but that's a policy of when do you share information with Homeland Security, what's the format, what's the extent that you do so that if you actually uh, potentially share that information, 
um, how do you not break legal privilege, um, uh, which is a big concern about sharing that information with government or even law enforcement, um, uh, depending on the, the circumstances. Usually it's covered, um, but uh, um, uh, information shared with the FBI once cases are closed are potentially subject to a FOIA request, um, and so that their sharing of threat information, while increasingly common or desired by companies, um, the new law certainly helps set the guidelines and the boundaries of what companies can do, and, and potentially that will grow um, as, over the years as companies get, companies get increasingly experienced in doing that. Training and communication is a big area. People don't always think about terrorist threats at work. It's a, uh, a lower probability um, uh, event, but if they're, they're made aware of what to look for, they can help in prevention and detection, and if they're also trained in response um, you can minimize and mitigate um, any damages. In the same way that cyber has been adding many more war, war games to companies to help companies uh, uh, plan and practice what to do in the event of a simulated cyber response, uh, cyber attack, um, many of those uh, simulations have included one, of, one game or a scenario or two that involves a terrorist organization. So that's actually a good place to bring together technical, physical security, um, and to test an integrated simulation that involves uh, both uh, cyber activity but coming from a terrorist uh, sort, uh, source. And that's something that many organizations that we've had have really enjoyed that and found that to be very fascinating and to really test the boundaries of whether or not they were prepared uh, to handle something like that. And uh, some organizations, depending on their, their, their threat profile, have been conducting terrorist uh, risk assessments. And uh, um, I mentioned the war game simulation as something that uh, is increasingly popular. OK, technical responses, uh, technical controls that can be leveraged here. And monitoring is one of the most common areas that companies invest a significant amount of money now looking for employee misconduct, looking for cyber attacks, looking for a number of other things that aren't necessarily terrorist related. But if you're looking for certain types of indicia of activity that would set off triggers and alerts, there's not a reason that you can't go back and review those triggers and alerts to expand the scope of what they would include. So many organizations either have or have contracted with um, security operation centers to help them look for cyber threats. Increasingly now, especially for ones that are internal so it's easier to do, they are combining that with threats and indicators that come from physical security, from facilities and from countries and from um, uh, political risk uh, that many companies have received reports on what's happening in, in foreign jurisdictions that might impact their companies, their facilities, their people, or their executives as they, as they move. And so not just looking at a cyber-only risk, but could be looking for terrorist uh, um, cyber activity that's motivated and conducted by terrorists, as I mentioned before, but this cross-event horizon, looking at different threats at the same uh, gives you a different le level of complexity and something. Uh, while I was at Booz Allen, I saw many companies and companies working with government to really um, further um, uh, this to protect uh, both government as well as corporate uh, assets as, as, as well and their people. Next is log monitoring, looking for system impropriety um, on uh, uh, network resources and assets. The important thing here is that you know what the information that could be valuable. So if it's intellectual property, your chemical facility and plant, great. Or biological warfare at a pharmaceutical company, great. You know the, the information that might be valuable and of interest to the terrorist group. But there might be information about scheduling or, um, uh, and travel plans, uh, especially even outsourced uh, travel information that might be for, for key executives that should be a little bit more highly guarded um, than many companies have set those. 
And so watching um, the log monitoring for things on the network that relate to all sorts of information um, uh, is, is helpful to going back now to assess what is business critical information that gets this type of monitoring. And reviewing your data classification scheme is something that a number of companies uh, are, are doing to make sure that they've got the, the right attention on the right assets. Um, the the um, uh, Cyber Fusion Center, as I mentioned before, companies are investing a lot more for cyber looking for different information from multiple centers like the Security Operations Center. Um, um, physical security is also putting together fusion centers, um, uh, integrating uh, with uh, aspects of cyber uh, to be able to enhance their geographical view of the company's um, assets and its people as, as well. Right, data loss prevention is another type of monitoring that monitors uh, the content of emails um, or file transfers that are, are leaving companies. That's actually one of the best tools that are used to prevent privacy violations and email attachments that go out with social security numbers or health related information um, or driver's license information or things like that. And every company, based on their industry and their unique jurisdiction, they monitor the diction they, they uh, modify the dictionary, customize it for, the, for their own organization. And here, that's an area where by putting in key search terms or uh, locations for certain data or, or um, uh, uh, um, uh, certain data classification markings within files themselves, those types of documents or information um, can be stopped from being exfiltrated or exported out of the company, whether it's by email or a file transfer, um, if the right definitions are put into place. So that's something that uh, organizations are doing and that you should consider doing, uh, going back and making sure that you have these protections to make sure that they're looking not just for intellectual property and not just looking for um, uh, privacy violations, but they also can help you um, uh, keep track of the information that you have that might be valuable uh, on the terrorist front. Um, phone and electronic communications monitoring systems, many organizations have um, capabilities to do that. Uh, and they either don't use them very frequently or they only use it in situations of potential employee um, uh, wrongdoing, like harassment of another employee and someone's made a complaint, so you have a reasonable basis. Um, if you're going to be increasingly doing this, it's important that you modify your policies and procedures to do this. You've got the right consent and notices in the right legal basis to be able to do it too. But it's something that, uh, um, uh, based on your threat profile, um, uh, you should consider uh, looking into if, uh, um, if that's a risk that would be um, germane to you. Now the next is access control design. Right? The same way you look at how do we limit access to financial reporting information, uh, intellectual uh, property, um, e-discovery and litigation information, or personal information, or other highly sensitive or valuable com company information, same thing too with some of the information that might seem low risk generally, but in the wrong hands can be used for terrorists. When you identify what those um, assets are, access control design and monitoring um, uh, who has limited access to that, and then applying some of the monitoring controls we talked about at the beginning uh, will help you uh, better manage uh, um, those assets. Network and file segregation. Many companies have shared drives or large databases for many people to share uh, information. Again, don't put, you segregate out that information, segregate the network to divide things up so that people only have, can get access to things that are related to maybe their part of the company or to their business or only to HR, then it's harder to be able to, for people to get a broader uh, uh, access into information that might be um, uh, more widely available. Um, and so dividing up the network or putting sensitive information files in very limited places with, with very limited access is something that companies are doing. And finally, let's talk about threat intelligence and uh, what's being done um, since the passage of the Cybersecurity Information uh, Sharing Act. Um, that was part of the Cybersecurity Act of 2015. Now, under 
CISA that was established at the end of the year, it creates uh, a mechanism for companies to share and receive real-time uh, information about cyber threat indicators and potential defensive measures from uh, the Department of Homeland Security or the U.S. Um, uh, CERT organization. And that is something that's been incredibly valuable. But up until December 2015, companies very often, when they had breaches, terrorists or not, didn't want to and shouldn't necessarily discuss that information um, uh, um, because they would be breaking legal privilege. Usually you seek counsel and keep that information uh, guarded un under privilege as you navigate um, the forensic investigation and uh, responding and whatever responses that you'd have to make uh, from that. And so many organizations, there was a disincentive to share and to serve as an early warning network to others of potential threats and problems. Under CISA, it allows companies to share that information um, uh, and so it can impact and help both federal entities as well as others within their industry and if they follow the guidelines and they share information uh, using the right taxonomy and, and limit it to what's uh, supposed to be shared, uh, then there is a protection, um, a safe harbor from violating or breaking uh, legal privilege. That's significant. That's huge. So if enough companies start participating in what they're seeing out there, it would, the, the intent is to allow this to create an early warning network among companies um, uh, to both inform government so, it, it, so the government can help take action, but also for then helping uh, for uh, Homeland Security to share that information back out to companies to allow them to protect themselves, make sense, better sense of the, of the, the, uh, the activity that they're seeing, the government can confirm that those threat indicators are part of something much larger and, and will indicate what the defensive measures that uh, should be taken to that specific type of threat. So from a security point of view, this is a great thing. But information that's shared, what if it has personal information in it um, as a subset? What if it wasn't properly de-identified? There are a lot of privacy concerns and discussions about this bill. Um, and, and so there, there were both sides of the aisle um, and uh, privacy advocates and security advocates um, didn't always see eye to eye on, on, on this bill. But now that it's there, and I don't have to take sides, I can help everyone <laughs> move forward, um, the companies are, are developing policies and procedures about what to share, when to share, the format and the, ta the taxonomy so that they make sure that they maintain legal privilege and they can start deriving the benefit that this program was intended to do. Uh, for those of you that want to talk to your technical and IT people to make sure that they're getting the benefit of this, there's not a cost to the program, uh, and for them to share information with, health and, uh, with uh, Homeland Security, um, and what they can do is uh, um, uh, you can share, share these slides with them, and the last bullet point will tell them that uh, the machine language um, formats, both sticks and taxi, that are being used from the technical perspective to share that information back and forth. And so that you may have threat intelligence information already being received that's then incorporated into your systems and sends alerts and does different things, but if you're not using that taxonomy, you can't take advantage of, uh, uh, of, the, of the Homeland Security program that's there. So those are um, a quick run through the administrative and technology safeguards um, that you can be put in place and to leverage them. But really it starts with people, it starts with governance, and making sure that you have the commitment and um, uh, um, to be able to move ahead with uh, uh, those, those programs. Um, and so for a case study, uh, uh, let me introduce, uh, start to introduce Preston from Walmart. He's going to tell you a little bit about uh, what they've been doing. Preston, you want to jump in and introduce yourself and take it away? Jim, sorry. Uh, uh, just before we introduce, uh, just before we introduce Clinton, I know um, we're over time now, and some people are going to probably have to drop off. But I think it's quite important that we hear um, 
Clinton's uh, case study and the and sort of um, the lessons that Walmart's learned through their sort of journey with it. Um, I will um, we'll take a look at the questions at the end as well still. And so if people have to drop off, all this will be on the recording. So uh, Clinton, over to you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Bill. Um, so, so I don't have slides uh, necessarily to, to present with anybody, but I'm happy to, to uh, answer questions as well. What I thought I would do just briefly is talk through, one, just um, the scope of Walmart, um, the structure of our, uh, what we call uh, Global Investigations Se uh, Security Aviation and Travel Division, or GSAT, as you'll hear us call it, um, some of our guiding principles, and some of the methods and actions that, that we take um, to address global risk. So um, first I'll talk about the scope of, our, uh, of, of, of Walmart. So. Um, uh, we're, we're quite large. We, we operate over 12,000 retail locations um, across the globe in 27 different countries, um, and we, uh, uh, you know, operate under a multitude of, of different retail banners. Uh, globally, we primarily primarily have grown through merger and acquisition, um, and we outside of our retail footprint, we also have a corporate footprint. Um, in a multitude of other countries where we may not have retail operations, um, but they're more focused on our sourcing and global e-commerce operation. So, um, you know, with, with that being said, you know, we find ourselves connected um, to just about any global event that occurs um, has some sort of impact uh, either directly or um, sometimes indirectly on, on Walmart, our associates, our operations. Um, next, I'll talk about the structure of, of, our, of our organization, the organization I belong to. Um, I've been part of the Global Investigation Security Avi Aviation and Travel Division um, here at Walmart, or GSAT, uh, uh, here at Walmart since 2004. Um, we are a group of, um, you know, uh, uh, experts in a variety of different fields. Um, we have the responsibility for protecting our associates, protecting our assets. Um, and so within our division, there are about 14 different departments focused on things like executive protection, um, uh, emergency management, uh, international asset protection. Um, we have uh, our physical security technology group. We have facilities protections group and our corporate, uh, corporate security team. So a wide variety of uh, responsibilities, uh, not to mention we also operate um, you know, uh, our own private fleet of, of aircraft and, um, and conduct all the commercial um, travel bookings for um, the entire enterprise. So, so with that being said, some of the things um, that, that we focus on are some of the guiding principles that within our division that, that we focus on are, are first that we're trusted partners collaborating globally across all business units um, using our unique expertise uh, to deliver practical and timely solutions uh, tailored to Walmart's operating environment. So that's our kind of our vision statement, right? Um, you'll hear us say across the division, um, we, we sum a lot of what we do up in three words. We, we say associate operations community. Um, so, so that's kind of the, uh, uh, the drumbeat behind a lot of what we do. So um, a lot of what we do is focused on um, responding to, taking and taking care of, and protecting our associates first, um, and, and, and making sure that after a significant event, we can account for and, and address any needs that they may have. Um, also, prepare them um, for events um, and risk that uh, that may happen in their at at the workplace. Um, and then we talk about operations. So preparing our operations in advance of and making sure they understand risks um, uh, uh, that are unique to, to our operation, um, and also responding to and recovering our operation uh, uh, after, after a significant event or a disruption. Um, and then finally, the community, right? So we do a lot of um, work with, um, with the community after, um, after disasters, after um, uh, uh, disruptive events, um, we work with the communities that um, our associates and, uh, live and work in um, to ensure that um, they have the support um, from, a, from our corporation as well. And then, so, so the next topic I really want to move into is kind of the, our methods and actions. So 
Jim and Bill talked a lot about um, a lot of different topics, you know, a variety of topics that we have, you know, either been uh, a, a victim of uh, those 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 uh, uh, those issues, um, or are responsible for researching and mitigating here at Walmart. Um, so, so, you know, where where we were um, in the past are, are we had, uh, you know, being a, a, a large organization, um, we had a lot of silos uh, within our organization. So. Um, what we've been focused on is, from a risk perspective, understanding one groups that uh, outside of our our team that are focused on researching and um, mitigating risk, um, and partnering with those, those organizations across the globe, uh, and, and that have maybe different focuses um, uh, of, or or risk focus um, than than we do. Um, and you know, we talked about you know. Operate, uh, operationalizing um, uh, risk research or intelligence. So we are responsible for uh, also taking in um, intelligence that we get from a variety of third parties um, and internal uh, perspectives um, and making sense of it. Um, you'll hear our leaders talk about the so what. Um, so we, you know, uh, Bill talked about just the the, the fire hose of data that comes into um, into an organization like ours, um, we are responsible for providing the so what. How we do that is one providing providing context um, uh, uh, on on a, on a specific issue, but we don't overwhelm our users or our business leaders um, uh, with everything we know about a topic. We provide context, but then we move quickly to how does how does this uh, particular topic impact Walmart, and what actions or considerations um, are we taking, or should we be taking, um, uh, to either mitigate or respond to a risk? Um, uh, uh, we also have been extremely focused on um, embedding our associates um, here in GSAT uh, within the appropriate business units to one partner with them, like I said in the beginning, um, so that. So that they can understand the needs of the business um, without uh, t just telling the business um, uh, everything they know about risk. So they can they can they can design their product or their output um, and using their expertise and understanding of risk and, and their capabilities to research um, this risk, they can design that output uh, to be more meaningful to the business. Finally, the, the, the other piece that we've really focused on, um, so we have a team of analysts here that um, help us uh, research uh, a variety of different uh, uh, tactical and strategic risk topics. Um, what we've done is uh, what I like to call, uh, we're, we're, we're based here in Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, what we've done is remove what we call the Bentonville layer. So we, we push our analysts directly to the person that is making decisions um, uh, based on risk research. So, um, uh, you know, there aren't very many layers between the analyst um, or our team that is uh, conducting research on risk and that actual decision maker within the company. Um, and, and, and so, so it, it, that is key um, for the speed at which we operate. Um, the, the retail business operates uh, 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 at a speed that um, many aren't used to. So, so um, uh, having that direct connection and the trust between um, the business leaders and, um, and and our analyst team or, or and our risk researchers um, is key for our success. And then finally, um, one of the, the pieces that that are key to um, uh, to all of this is we back all of this by policy. So we've recently created um, and are um, implementing across our, our enterprise uh, a program called GPTA is what we what you'll hear us call it, but it's the Global Protection of People and Assets. And um, within that within that program are 16 different um, uh, different topics um, focused on things like workplace violence. Business continuity, emergency management, and crisis management—you um, uh, uh, know, executive protection, 
uh, facilities protection. So, so it's a, a wide variety of topics. But what we've done is established minimum standards um, within each of these topics, working with the local business leaders in all of those markets that I mentioned earlier to, one, un so that they understand what the minimum standards are, they have a support structure to implement those minimum standards, but also have the freedom um, to uh, ensure that those programs are culturally, culturally relevant to where we're implementing those, those programs. And then ultimately, that they're owned by the business within that, um, with, with, within that uh, 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 geography or, or country that we've, we've uh, implemented that program. So, so it, you know, it starts, like I said, with having the right structure and the right vision and ultimately backed by a, a, a corporate policy, um, which is also um, uh, part of our duties is to report to our board of directors, uh, the audit committee within our board of directors, which, by the way, they're all here in Bentonville this week. We're, we're having our annual shareholders uh, week uh, here uh, in uh, Bentonville, Arkansas this week. So uh, we have all of our board of directors and about 5,000 associates joining us uh, um, for a large celebration this week. So one of the, the pieces that we're responsible for within our division is going back to our board of directors and reporting on the challenges and the successes um, of, our, uh, uh, of our policy rollout, of our risk research and um, risk management programs. Um, and they take a very hands-on role um, in, in helping us shape what that looks like. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and uh, just briefly, and talk through um, talk through what uh, uh, or give give the, the the group here that's still online to to ask questions and talk through some of what I've just briefly covered. Clinton, that's uh, that's great. Thank you, um, thank you so much. This I think some really valuable lessons learned there for others and uh, some of the ways that, ways that you um, have handled. Um, sort of broader threat the, the broader threat and what is sort of reasonably foreseeable in this new environment for uh, for you at Walmart it's really valuable so um, while people <clears throat> while people sort of have a chance to type in their questions to Clinton um, why don't we uh, why don't we address the first question from uh, from Jack if that makes sense um, so Jack's question is would we all agree that an active shooter event in the workplace is now reasonably foreseeable um, my response would that would be to that that that's uh, yes it's, it's absolutely uh, reasonably foreseeable within um, certainly within the U.S. context and in a lot of uh, Western Europe as well. Um, I think my and and we're um, the number of requests we've had for active shooter programs and the uh, the, the plans uh, around them and um, the briefings that that we've conducted um, and in fact unfortunately in the response to active shooter incidents. The one caveat I would say is that um, an active shooter program has to be part of a uh, sort of a wider risk management and governance program, and needs to there needs to be sort of an assurance level that it is um, really um, driven from the top and promulgated around uh, around the employee base with sort of that leadership buy-in. It's not just a bolt-on to, uh, to to sort of other training that's done. So that would be my comment on it, but I, Clinton, it might be interesting to hear from you in terms of um, uh, in terms of Walmart, how you've handled that and how you sort of integrated that into your wider program. Yeah, I I, I agree uh, completely. Um, not only is it foreseeable, it's, it's happened, um, you know, um, at our at our locations, um, not just you know active shooter events, but you know, um, uh, uh, you know, we've had you know. Uh, unfortunately, we've had these events uh, occur on our on our properties, both in a in a, a retail environment in the in our stores, as well as our our corporate uh, uh, facilities um, or logistics facilities. So so you're right. We've we've spent a lot of time um, focus on um, our active shooter and workplace violence uh, program. That group is part of our our our, our GSAT uh, division, and they support. Um, not only the, the U.S. operation, but um, our, our, all of our other markets as well. Um, you know, you're right as far as the, the tone at the top for us um, has to be right, and it's part of our, our global program. It's a board back and a board back initiative for us. Um, we've um, 
we've implemented a series of training and informational sessions across our across our entire organization. Uh, you know, um, and I'm fine sharing. I can share inf more information about that offline. But but um, we use the uh, avoid, deny, defend um, uh, program here, um, or ADD, uh, uh, which you'll hear it called here. But um, it, it, we've we've done a we've had a, a lot of activity around this, uh, this this issue. So it starts with us, like I said, the tone at the top, training of all of our associates. Um, you know, it's 1.2 million associates um, worldwide, um, so that they understand um, what they can do to prepare themselves and what they need to do in the event of of this uh, 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 of this type of issue occurring at their workplace. Um, but then also um, always focus on improving the program. So um, we haven't just pushed a training and then um, you know uh, uh, you know annualizing that training um, over those associates. We have a continuous focus on maturing and understanding um, what the threat or threats are um, and incorporating that into um, our, our information that we share with all of our associates globally. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. And then so the, the last question we have, unless anybody else has any others, is uh, from Trevor. So, um, do do we feel that given the economic conditions we are seeing uh, companies are becoming more reactive with regards to security budgeting regardless of risk profile? I'm seeing this in the oil and gas industry, um, but is this a trend in other industries? So I'd be interested in hearing from Jim on this, but my take is um, that um, it really depends on the industry. So we're seeing some industries that are, I think, more proactive than they used to be, um, and obviously those are um, those are sectors that are uh, are doing well in this economy or are uh, pushing into new areas more aggressively than they had before. But certainly, uh, definitely would agree with Trevor that you know uh, across oil and gas and mining and other sectors that are in distress, um, it, we're seeing a lot more reactivity than proactivity, which is unfortunate. And in a lot of ways, it's a I mean you you have a certain level of reactivity um, that is you know, by design because um, uh, security departments are being cut back and there's less time to do proactive work. So people that had previously been in management roles and doing sort of proactive thinking about security strategy and the business of security are now having to do reactive sorts of tasks because their, their staff have been cut. It's also a self-fulfilling prophecy where a lot of security departments we're seeing are um, are having to be reactive because they simply don't have the eyes and ears and the boots on the ground in areas where they experience the risk to be able to get ahead of things, and they're just, you know, sort of reacting to things that are coming in without having any sort of uh, sight on those. What's important, obviously, is that what Clinton had mentioned from in terms of the, uh, the the ability to sort of keep pace with the business and um, and stay in with the business in sort of a where where security meets and risk management meets strategy. Uh, and the ability to have a seat at that table. Now, that's certainly not possible to the degree that Walmart has it in some sectors, but, uh, I mean, that should be the goal, to be able to sort of integrate the business with um, uh, with security and with, with the risk management strategy. I know, Jim, would you agree with that? No, I, I would definitely agree with that. And what I'm seeing is, look, cybersecurity has driven a lot of companies to invest more in cybersecurity. So companies that have the funds and the wherewithal, and often that's, Industry based um, financial services has long been making investments. Healthcare, because of the significant um, cyber um, impacts that have happened uh, within uh, providers, uh, doctors, and hospitals, um, and some health insurers, um, has significantly stepped up. Pharma has always been there, oil and gas, uh, in, in criticality. The national infrastructure ones are spending more money. But for the industries, that don't have the funds, and for the companies that aren't performing well, this is causing them to reevaluate what their investments are and to allocate differently, maybe retire certain tools or invest in new ones. And so this makes it a perfect time to say, hey, look, the terrorist threat is now larger and has certain uh, um, uh, things that we need to address that that's a little more unique to our business or our industry, so can we allocate some funds toward that, and that's what's driving integration, too. 
you can do more with less if you take these integrated approaches. Walmart's a wonderful example of one that did it to actually do a better job across all of the areas that were integrated, um, but it, it also has a, um, uh, for some companies, if it's if, in the way it's done, can also help them do more with less uh, if you're looking at more things simultaneously. Yeah, and um, this is Clinton again. I, I, I agree. I think um, one of the one of our focuses, you know, you know, has been to, you know, uh, um, we have a we have a large set of customers, and one of the things that we're working on building is what we call the common risk operating picture. Um, so part of that is um, pushing tools and capabilities uh, to the edge to make um, some of our customers more self sufficient so that we can prioritize um, some of what we're researching and, the, and, um, and what we're focused on. So you'll hear our CEO talk about, uh, um, he called it peering around the corner of, um, on risk. Um, so so um, what we've done is try to set up a layer, an infrastructure to help serve um, uh, our customers uh, uh, you know, and make them self-sufficient and that they, we, our, our research is being consumed by a broader audience, but then also what that by setting up that that infrastructure uh, layer in front of us, it allows us to prioritize some of that more um, uh, uh, analytical, uh, uh, that more intensive work, uh, complex and nuanced work, um, and uh, and give us time to focus on those activities that helps us get more predictive, helps us get more in front of uh, um, some of those risks. So without that infrastructure or that layer in front of it, which we're still developing. Um, we would never have time to be focused uh, on the future. Okay, good. I think that's all of the questions we had. Um, so we're we're now obviously way over time, but um, I, I want to thank Chelsea and Atmosphere for for helping us out with this and for hosting it. Chelsea, should I turn it back over to you? Yes, and on behalf of Best Fair, I would like to thank all of you attendees who did join us today. There was a bunch of information that was shared, and I hope it was helpful to you. As a reminder, we did record today's presentation. We will be sending you that along with all of the materials and the presentation you see here within the next few business days. So we encourage you to share that with not only yourself and your colleagues um, to give them a better perspective on this issue. Um, I'd also like to express some special thanks to Bill, Jim, and Clinton for leading a great presentation. Um, as a reminder, this webcast and all future FS Fair webcasts are available complimentary and on demand for our Bella members. Um, our Business Ethics Leadership Alliance fellow members are also offered complimentary registrations to different summits around the world. Global Ethics Summit will be in Latin America next week, as well as we're expanding into the Middle East, London, and Asia um, for our fourth time this year. So if you'd like to gain more information about that, you can visit ethicsphere.com slash events to, to learn more about what more webcasts, roundtables, or summits we have in your area. Once again, thank you all for joining us. If you have any questions about this webcast or any other future events, do not hesitate to let us know. Thanks again. Have a fantastic day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.